Let's seek the Lord in prayer. Father, what a glorious day this has been. Thank you, Father, for all of the things that we take for granted. Thank you for the crisp, fresh air and the sunshine, especially for the sunshine of your love that shines in our hearts. And Father, we thank you for your word. What would it be like in this world without your word? we would be running around in confusion, not knowing where things are moving. But because we have your word, we have a sure compass. We just ask, Father, that as we open your holy book, that your spirit will be with us to guide our thoughts and to open our hearts. And we thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer and for answering, because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In our study today, we are going to discuss the Incarnation's Seven Secrets. But before we talk about the Incarnation, I need to cover one other point, which is extremely important, not only for what we're going to talk about tonight, but for what we're going to discuss later on in our seminar. And that is, what was Jesus like before his Incarnation? Now, I can tell you for absolute certain that Jesus, before he came to this world, was God in every sense of the word. He is God by nature. He is not like God, neither did he become God. He is God. And so I'd like to read several verses as we begin that show the deity, the full deity and godhood of Jesus Christ. Let's begin by reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 1. And we're going to go through these quickly because our main theme is not having to do with the deity of Christ, but rather with his humanity. John chapter 1, verse 1, very well known, you probably can repeat it from memory. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not a God, like you find in one Bible, but the Word was God. Now let's go to John chapter 8 and verse 58. Here Jesus makes a revolutionary statement. He's speaking to the Jews, and he says something that is going to shake them up. John 8 verse 58. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And the very next verse says that the Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus because according to them, he was committing blasphemy because he was claiming to be the I am who appeared in the burning bush. He was claiming to be Almighty God. Let's go now to John chapter 17 and verse 3. John chapter 17 and verse 3. This verse makes it very clear that Jesus existed before his incarnation. It says there, and this is his high priestly prayer to his father in the garden of Gethsemane. He says, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you when? Before the world was. Did Jesus exist before the world was? Yes. In fact, John chapter 1 verse 3 says that all things were made through him, which means that he pre-existed all things. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. And we're going through these verses quickly because I just want you to see that Jesus, before he became incarnate, was fully and completely God. 
Matthew 1, verse 23, here the angel is speaking, and he says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with us. In other words, one of the names of Jesus, Emmanuel, means God with us. Now let's go to John chapter 10 and verse 30. Here Jesus makes another revolutionary statement that shook up the Jews. It says there in John chapter 10 and verse 30, very short, I and my Father are one. Now Jesus is not saying that He and the Father are the same person. What He is saying is that He and the Father are one in the sense of perfect unity. They are one like a husband and wife when they get married become one. Two persons in perfect unity. In other words, Jesus is saying, I and my Father are one. We are perfectly united in attributes, in power, and in character. Now let's go to Philippians chapter 2, and let's read verses 5 through 7. Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 7. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, that word form is very important, it's the Greek word morphe, which means by nature, it means in substance he was God. In other words, it says, who being in the form of God, or of the same substance or essence of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. A better translation is, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. And then it says, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. So it's interesting that the word morphe is used, which in Greek indicates the very substance or essence of God. God is of the substance of God. Now let's notice also John chapter 1 and verse 51. This is speaking about the ladder that Jacob saw in his dream. John chapter 1 and verse 51. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now when you go back to Genesis chapter 28, you find something very interesting. You find that it says that the ladder was firmly planted on the earth, and the top of the ladder reached to the highest heaven. Now the bottom of the ladder represents the humanity of Christ. He is one with us. But the top of the ladder represents the Godhood or the divinity of Jesus Christ because He is one with the Father. In other words, Jesus can bridge heaven and earth because He's God with God and He is man with man. So the first thing that I want us to notice is that Jesus, according to the New Testament, is God in every sense of the word. But the ladder shows that Jesus is also man in every sense of the word. Now let's read several verses that present Jesus Christ as fully being a man, being human. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, and you have these on the list of texts. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born from whom? Born of a woman born under the law. Was Jesus born of a woman just like we are born from a woman? Absolutely. He was born of a woman. Galatians 3 verse 16 tells us that Jesus was of the seed of Abraham. He was a descendant of Abraham, and Abraham was a human being. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. In other words, Christ is the seed of whom? He is the seed of Abraham. Abraham was a human being, therefore Jesus, being his descendant, is also a human being. 
Now notice Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. This is a very interesting verse referring both to the divinity and to the humanity of Jesus Christ. It says there in Revelation 22 verse 16, Jesus is speaking, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. And now notice what he says. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Did you notice here that Jesus is David's father and he's also David's son? Now the question is, how can you be a person's father and be that person's son also? Because Jesus is the root of David. In other words, David comes from him, but he is also the offspring of David. In what sense is Jesus the root of David? In the sense that Jesus was the creator before he became a man. But he's the offspring of David because he became what? He became a man and he was a descendant by the flesh from David. Now notice John chapter 1 and verse 14. Another verse that speaks about the humanity of Christ. John chapter 1 and verse 14. It says, and the word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt could very well be translated tabernacled or pitched his tent in our midst. Now tonight we're going to talk about the ministry of Jesus in the camp before he went to the court to die. We're going to talk about the fact that Jesus came to live in our midst. He became one of us where we are camped on this earth. So it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. There are so many of these verses in Scripture that speak about the humanity of Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the what? God was manifested in the flesh. So he's God, but he also took upon himself human nature. Now let's notice Luke 24 and verse 39. Some people think that Jesus was a man until his resurrection. And then after his resurrection, he left his manhood and he just took back his nature of God and he went to heaven as God. But notice that after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus is still a full man. It says in Luke 24, verse 39, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Did Jesus have flesh and bones after his resurrection? He most certainly did. Now there's another interesting passage in John chapter 10 in verses 24 to 28. There was a disciple that wasn't present when Jesus appeared to the disciples the evening of the resurrection. That disciple's name was Thomas. We know him as Doubting Thomas. And in a minute you're going to see why we call him Doubting Thomas. John chapter 20 and verses 24 through 29. Thomas is now there the Sunday after the Sunday of the resurrection. And let's pick up the story there in verse 24. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hand the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Was Jesus a real human being after his resurrection? He most certainly was. Now let's notice also Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. Hebrews chapter 2 
and verses 14 and 15. This is so clear. It says there, Inasmuch then as the children, that's us, have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all of their lifetime subject to bondage. So did Jesus come to this earth and take flesh and blood according to Scripture? He most certainly did. He was a human being in every sense of the word, but he was also God. He is called the God-man. He is God and he is man in one person, two natures in one person. Please don't ask me to explain that. It's a mystery. I can't explain how one person could have two natures, the nature of God and the nature of man. That's one of the mysteries that I don't know even if God is going to explain it to us in eternity. But for now, we don't need to know how it happened. We need to know that it's true because the Bible says so. Now we want to study a little bit more why it was necessary for Jesus to become a man. Why was it necessary for him to come and camp with us? See, the sanctuary had the camp, it had the court, it had the holy place, and the most holy place. Most Christians start in the court with the death of Jesus Christ. We're going to start in the camp because that's where needy sinners live. Jesus, before he died, came to live in our midst, didn't he? He took flesh of our flesh and bone of our bones and blood of our blood. He came to live with us for over 30 years before he died. So his life with us must have extreme significance. So we're going to start with the life of Jesus in the camp. The question is, why did Jesus have to become one of us? Why did he have to become a man? I have at least seven reasons that I want to share with you as to why it was absolutely indispensable that Jesus come to the camp of the sanctuary and live with us in our midst, take our flesh and our blood and our bones. Reason number one, so that he could reveal what God is really like. You see, before sin, Adam and Eve had face-to-face -face communion with God. But when Adam and Eve sinned, God had to conceal himself from Adam and Eve. Because if he had not concealed himself, Adam and Eve would have been destroyed instantly because God cannot coexist with sin. So God had to conceal himself. I want you to notice Exodus chapter 33 and verse 20 where we're told clearly that no one can see the face of God and live in their sinful condition. It says there in Exodus 33 and verse 20, but he said, you cannot see my face. Here God is speaking. For no man shall see me and what? And live. Notice also Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verses 23 and 24. God is spoken of as a consuming fire against sin. It says there, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. And make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a what? Is a consuming fire, a jealous God. In fact, we're told, and this verse isn't on your list, but you might want to write it down. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 15 and 16 tells us that God dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen nor can see, at least in their sinful condition. So God had a problem because the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve spoke with God face to face, but when man sinned, God had to conceal himself because his glory would have destroyed these sinners. But the Bible tells us that in order to be saved, we must know Jesus Christ and we must know God. In fact, let's read that in John chapter 17 and verse 3. John chapter 17 and verse 3. Here Jesus is speaking and he says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, 
remember he's speaking to his father, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Let me ask you, is it indispensable to know God in order to have eternal life, in order to have salvation? Absolutely. But now we have a problem. How could man know God if God had to conceal himself from man because of man's sin? Well, the fact is that God solved the problem partially in the Old Testament by revealing himself in words and in pictures through the sanctuary. He gave symbols, he spoke to the prophets, he gave visions, he gave dreams, he spoke through the Urim and the Thummim. In other words, he gave a partial and incomplete description of who God is. But it wasn't a personal appearance of God. It was words and symbols about God. Because God cannot reveal himself in his divine nature, Jesus Christ came to this earth and he veiled his divine glory under human flesh so that we could see what God is like without the glory of God destroying us. In other words, Jesus became a man to veil his divine glory so that he could reveal the Father to us and not destroy us at the same time. You say, where do we find that in Scripture? Notice Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. There's a comparison that is made here between how God revealed himself in the Old Testament and how he reveals himself when Jesus comes. It says there in Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in this, these last days spoken to us by whom? By his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So in the Old Testament, he revealed himself through the prophets. But in these last days, he has revealed himself to us through whom? Through his Son. Notice John 1.14 once again that we read uh, a little while ago about the humanity of Christ. It says there, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now notice what Jesus revealed. It says, and we beheld his what? His glory. It was veiled in human flesh, but the glory was revealed. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, there's no one in the universe who could reveal the Father like Jesus could reveal the Father. But he had to veil his divine glory, or he would have destroyed us as sinners. So he veils his glory, and he comes to reveal what his Father is like. In fact, notice John chapter 1 and verse 18. I love this verse. It's a beautiful verse. John chapter 1 and verse 18 says, No one has seen God at any time. There's the emphasis again. But now notice, the only begotten Son who is where? Who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Let me ask you, what, do you, what picture do you get when you talk about the bosom? closeness, intimacy. In other words, he who was in the bosom of his father, the closest of anyone to the father, has revealed what the father is like. And he's revealed him in his humanity because he veiled his divinity because it would have destroyed us. That's the reason why you remember Philip once asked, he said to Jesus, could you please show us the father? Notice John chapter 14 and verses 8 and 9. John chapter 14, and verses 8 and 9. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, yet you have not known me? He who has seen me has seen who? The Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Like Father, like Son. And so Jesus veils his divine glory and he reveals what God is like without destroying sinners. He had to assume human flesh to reveal God and at the same time not destroy sinners. 
There's a second reason why Jesus had to assume human flesh, had to take human flesh. And that is so that Jesus could die for our sins. You say, why would he have to take humanity in order to die for our sins? It's very simple. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. We've read this before, but let's read it again. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. Speaking about God says, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has what? Immortality. What does God have? Immortality. Dwelling, here it is, in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. What does God have? God has immortality. Can God die? That would be ridiculous to say that God can die. God is by nature immortal. He is life, eternal within himself. God as God cannot die. So why would Jesus have to assume human nature? He would have to assume nature, a mortal human nature, so that he could what? So that he could die for our sins. Because if he had come, and come merely as God, he couldn't have died. Because God is immortal. God does not die. Now the question is, did Jesus really die? He most certainly did. Notice Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. It says here, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of what? Death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste what? Death for everyone. Did Jesus really die? Did his divinity or deity die? No, his humanity died. He had to become a man in order to die for our sins. If Jesus had not come as a man, we would still be in our sins. Notice John chapter 19, verse 30, speaking about the death of Christ. He really died. It says, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is what? It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his what? He gave up his spirit. Did Jesus really die? Of course he really died. Did he die for his own sins or did he die for our sins? He died for our sins. He assumed human nature, mortal human nature, so that he could die because God, the deity of God, does not die. Ellen White, in the book Selective Messages, volume 1, page 30, has this very interesting remark. She says, and she's quoting Christ, I am the resurrection and the life. He who had said, I lay down my life that I might take it again, now notice this, came forth from the grave to life that was in himself. When Jesus came from the tomb, he came with a life that was within himself because he was God. But notice what she continues saying. Humanity died. Divinity did not die. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. He declares that he has life in himself to quicken whom? He will. So Jesus assumed human, mortal human nature so that Jesus could die for our sins. And by the way, this is the reason why the devil tried to keep Jesus from going to the cross. You say, what? I thought, I thought uh, the devil wanted Jesus to go to the cross and die. Oh, no, he didn't. The devil tried to keep Jesus from going to the cross. Let me give you several examples. On the Mount of Temptation, the devil says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you just bow down and worship me. You don't have to go to the cross. Remember Peter, when Jesus said, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die and resurrect the third day? What did Peter say? Oh, that should never happen to you. And then Jesus said, get thou behind me, Satan. He wasn't speaking to Peter, he's speaking to the devil, who was trying to use Peter to distract Jesus from the cross. Even towards the end of his life, some Greeks come to Jesus and they say, we want you to come and preach the gospel in Greece. And Jesus says, it's not time to preach the gospel in Greece. He says, it's time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Even when Judas betrayed Jesus. See, some people think that Judas betrayed Jesus because he wanted Jesus killed. No way. The devil used Judas 
to betray Christ because he was hoping that Christ, when he was arrested and he was mistreated, he would take over the throne. And you say, how do we know that? Because when his plan backfired, he took the money and he threw it and he went and committed suicide. If he wanted Jesus to die, he would have been happy. But his plan backfired. Even when Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, hanging there, there were people at the foot of the cross saying, if you're really the Son of God, what? Come down from the cross. You say, well, didn't the devil want to kill Jesus? Yes, the devil wanted to kill Jesus, but the devil did not want Jesus to give his life voluntarily himself. The devil tried to kill Jesus many times during his ministry, but killing Jesus would not be a sacrifice for sin because the Bible says that Jesus had to voluntarily give his life, give himself to save man. It wasn't enough for the devil simply to kill him. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so Jesus had to become a man so that he could die for our sins. And by the way, his death is once for all. Jesus doesn't, is not continually being sacrificed like it's taught in, in one uh, church these days. They say, you know, you repeat the sacrifice of Jesus over and over again. No way. When Jesus died on the cross, he died once and for all. No more sacrifices of Christ. It was unrepeatable and it was complete. In fact, we're told in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27, speaking about Christ, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did what? Once for all when he offered up himself. See, the devil didn't take his life. Jesus said, I lay down my life and I take it up again. Let's go to the third reason why Jesus had to become a man. He had to become a man so that we could know that he sympathizes with us that he understands us. Notice Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Here's the principle. It says, For every high priest taken from among men, taken from where? From among men, is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Verse 2. He can have what? compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to what? To weakness. Let me ask you, does Jesus really understand us? Can he really sympathize with us? Can we know that he knows what it's like to walk in our shoes? Absolutely. Notice Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11 and then we'll read verse 14 and verse 17. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11 says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified, that's Jesus and us, are all of what? Because we're all what? We're all human beings. And now notice what it continues saying. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them what? Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren because we all are human beings. We all come from one. Verse 14 Inasmuch then as the children, that's us, have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 17, therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren. Why did he have to be made like us, his brethren, a human being? Here's the reason, that he might be a what? A merciful, and what else? and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So Jesus had to become a human being so that he could be merciful and he could be faithful and he could re represent us as one who understands our situation. Several years ago, you might remember this, these images came across the television screen of all of these people that were dying of hunger in Ethiopia. Skin and bones. People covered with flies. You remember that? The scene was grotesque. Now let me tell you something. I felt sorry for those people. 
But did I really understand what they were going through? No. I could intellectually say, wow, that's terrible. And I could sympathize with them to a certain degree. I could feel sorry for them, but I couldn't really understand them because I hadn't been in the, through their experience. You see, Jesus could have remained in heaven. And he could have seen the suffering on this earth and the pain and the sorrow. And he could have said, oh, it must, it's terrible what they're going through. He could have said to his father, oh, that, that grief is horrendous, isn't it? Would he really understand what we're going through? God would not understand. And so Jesus said, I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to become like one of them. And I'm going to walk in their shoes. I'm going to share their grief. I'm going to share their sorrow. I'm going to share their suffering. So that they can know that when I represent them in heaven, I understand. So that they can know that I empathize and I sympathize with them. Do you know, it's really tragic and I'll mention the name of the church, that the Roman Catholic Church feels like they need the Virgin Mary to do that job. Or they need the saints to do that job. See, in Roman Catholic theology, even though they pay lip service to the idea that Jesus is God and man, for them, Jesus is not fully man like us. He has a different kind of humanity than we do. And therefore, Jesus does not really fully understand us, so you really need Mary and the saints who really walked in our shoes to represent us before God. That's in practical Roman Catholic theology. But Scripture tells us that Jesus has walked in our shoes. He can fully and completely empathize and sympathize with us because He was and He is fully and completely human. Now, listen up. Jesus is the supreme pontiff. There's someone on earth who has claimed to be the supreme pontiff. Do you know what the word pontiff means? It comes from two words, pons and facio. It means bridge builder. Jesus is the supreme bridge builder. The bridge builder between what? Between heaven and earth. He is the ladder that connects heaven and earth because he's God and he is also man. What human being could ever claim to be the supreme bridge builder when he's only a man and not God? Notice 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. We have only one mediator. It says here, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now what part of one don't you understand? It's very clear. Notice John chapter 14 and verse 6. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except how? Except through me. Not through Mary, not through the saints, but through whom? Jesus. Because he's one of us, he understands us, he empathizes us with us, he sympathizes with us, he knows our situation. We don't need any other individuals who supposedly are more human than Jesus was. Jesus understands. Notice Hebrews chapter 7 verses 25 and 26. You see, in order for a priest to represent us, not only does he have to be man, but he has to be a perfect man. And he also has to be God. So that disqualifies all human priests. Because there's no human priest other than Jesus that has perfect humanity, and there's no human priest that is God. Now notice Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 25 and 26. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Through whom? Through Mary? No, through the saints? No, through Jesus. It says, since he always, what? Lives to make intercession for them. Why can Jesus intercede before the Father for us? Because not only he is a man, but he is a perfect man. So that disqualifies every priest that I've ever known. Notice what it continues saying in verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than what? Higher than the heavens. In order for Jesus to represent us, he has to be God 
and he has to be a perfect, sinless man. That disqualifies any priesthood on earth that claims to be able to represent us before the throne of God. You see, Jesus as God represents us before God. And Jesus as man represents God to us. In other words, Jesus is the supreme bridge builder. He has all of the qualifications to connect heaven and earth which are not possessed by any priest that I know of on planet earth. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 also emphasizes that Jesus can represent us because he is righteous. It says there in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have a what? We have an advocate with the Father. An advocate means what? A defense attorney. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the what? The righteous. Let me ask you, can an unrighteous priest represent us before God? God would say, zap. You're a sinner. You can't appear before me. The priest has to be what? Righteous. And when I come to Jesus, and we're going to talk about this in our next two lectures, when I come to Jesus and I'm repentant and I confess my sin, I say, Jesus, I'm miserable, I'm lost. Jesus, please take your righteousness, your perfect righteous life, and put it to my account. Jesus takes his righteous life and he places it to my account, and God looks upon me as if I had never sinned. A human priest cannot do that. Fourth reason why Jesus had to become a man. Is, it is the incarnation important? Oh, it's a matter of life and death, folks. He had to come and live in the camp before he could die in the court. Notice the fourth reason. Jesus became a man so that he could be tempted and help those who are tempted. Do you know the Bible says that God can't be tempted? Notice James chapter 1 and verse 13. James chapter 1 and verse 13. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be what? Tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Can God be tempted by evil? Of course not. So what would have happened if Jesus had come as God? Do you think the devil can deceive God? <laughs> Listen, if Jesus had come merely as God and the devil had tried to deceive de Jesus, Jesus says, you old devil, I know it's you. Because the omniscience of Jesus would not have, allow have allowed him to be deceived. That's why Jesus had to come as a man, to live as a man, to be tempted as a man, as we are tempted and yet overcome. You see, if Jesus had gained even one victory, over Satan by using his own divine power, the devil would have said, no fear. You expect human beings to overcome temptation, but they're human beings. You beat me as God. That's no fair. So Jesus came as a human being, and he did not gain any victory over sin by using his divine omnipotence or his divine omniscience. He gained the victory as each one of us can gain the victory as well. He had no advantages over us. Notice Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 14 through 16 where we find this clearly revealed that Jesus had to become a man in order to be tempted. Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 14 through 16. It says there, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. See, there's the idea that he can sympathize with us. Now notice what it continues saying. Who can sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in most points, ah, thank you very much, was in all points tempted such as Adam was. No, tempted such as what? Such as we are, yet what? Yet without sin. You see, Jesus, we are like little pebbles next to the seaside. Have you ever seen the waves come in? <laughs> the little pebbles, you know, they move up, and then the waves come down, the little pebbles move down. That's the way we are before temptation. We're moved to and fro. But if you've been to the Pacific Coast Highway, I love to go to the Pacific Coast Highway and just stand there, you know, from the heights and see those waves come crashing 
into those huge boulders on the edge of the sea, and the waves crash against the boulders, and the waves recede, and the boulders are still there. That's the way Jesus was. We're like little pebbles moved to and fro, but Jesus faced all of the waves of temptation. And yet when the waves receded, Jesus had been victorious. The Bible says that because he was tempted in all things such as we are, he is able to what? He is able to help us when we are tempted. And some people say, well, Pastor Bohr, but Jesus never sinned. How can he understand us? We do sin. Well, let me give you an illustration. If you were sinking in quicksand, Would you rather have someone on solid ground with a rope to throw to you, or would you rather have somebody in the quicksand sympathizing with you? <laughs> Imagine, both of you in the quicksand, oh, this is terrible, isn't it? Oh, we're sinking. Oh, we're going to die. <laughs> if Jesus had sinned, he would be in the quicksand with us. Praise the Lord that he faced temptation, every temptation, plus much more than we suffer, and yet he remained firm. He never sinned. If he had sinned, he could not be our Savior. Notice Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18. It says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. You see, Jesus is the great pioneer. Jesus has blazed the road before us. He knows all of the devil's tricks because he's already faced all of the devil's tricks. And he's able to reveal all of those tricks to us. He's able to say, now when it comes to this, remember to answer this way. When it comes to this temptation, remember to face it that way. He's been over the road. He's blazed the trail for us so that when we are tempted, we can overcome as he overcame. Reason number five why Jesus had to become a man and live in the camp with us. Jesus became a man in the likeness of sinful flesh, the Bible says, so that through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus could develop a perfectly righteous human life that he could impute to us and that he could impart to us. Now, those are fancy theological terms, impute and impart. So let me just explain what they mean. Jesus lived a perfect life. He lived the life that we should live. The life that the law requires, the law says, I demand perfection. If you don't give me perfection, you die. Jesus came and lived that perfect life that the law demands. He lived it in my place. So that when I come to Jesus in repentance, confessing my sin and trusting in his merits, Jesus takes the perfect life that he lived and he places it to my account and God looks upon me as if I had never sinned. Did Jesus have to become a man in order to credit his life to me? Absolutely. But Jesus not only came so that he could impute his life to us, he also came so that he could impart his righteousness to us so that we could live a holy life. The Holy Spirit that developed his life has the pattern now because the Holy Spirit developed the pattern life. That same Holy Spirit now is willing to mold our lives in harmony with the life of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not enough only for Jesus to live for us. Jesus also wants to live in us. The first is imputed righteousness. The second is called imparted righteousness. Now let me illustrate what I mean. And uh, some people have criticized me for using this illustration, but I'm going to use it anyway because I think it's a good illustration. Did Jesus gain any victory over temptation, over sin, by using his divine nature? Absolutely not. Did Jesus tell us that we're supposed to follow his example? Yes. Does he give us the power to follow his example? Absolutely. Now, listen up. Let's suppose that Superman existed. <laughs> Some people say, oh, I don't like that illustration. It's a good one. Believe me, it's a good one. Let's suppose that Superman existed. And Superman shows up here in the middle aisle, and he says to all of us, he says, 
follow me. And he flies off into the air. What would you say? <laughs> See you later. <laughs> you know what I tell him? I can't fly. You have powers that I don't have. Right? So let me ask you this question. Could Jesus ask us to follow his example if he used powers to develop that example that are not accessible to us? Absolutely not. The Bible repeatedly tells us that Jesus gave us an example that we're supposed to follow. And God gives us the power to follow the example. It's not only looking at the example, saying, okay, I'll copy it. No, the Holy Spirit gives us the power and lives the life of Jesus in us. Notice 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he what? As he walked. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 says, For this, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us what? An example that you should follow in his steps. John 10 verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they what? And they follow me. Now let's go quickly to reason number six why Jesus had to become a human being. Is the humanity of Jesus extremely important? It's a matter of life and death, folks. Number six, Jesus became a man so that he could serve as a sympathetic and impartial judge. Notice John chapter 5, verse 22, and then we'll jump down to verse 27. John chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 22 says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to whom? To his Son. Why has the Father committed the judgment to Jesus? Verse 27 says, And has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is what? Because he is the Son of of man. Why can Jesus judge? Because he is what? The son of man. Are we all going to have to stand before the great judgment seat of Christ? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now do you know what the good news is for those who have received Jesus Christ, have repented of sin, confessed their sin, and through the power of the Holy Spirit have gained the victory over sin? Do you know what the good news is? The judge is also our defense attorney. <laughs> I love that. Wouldn't you like to have a judge on your side? Yeah, see, Jesus has been through our experience. When we've come to him, Jesus not only will close the devil's mouth by saying, this individual, yes, sinned, absolutely, the record is there, but he or she received me as Savior and Lord. And therefore, I pronounce a judgment not guilty because the judge is also the advocate. That's good news. Let me ask you, could Jesus serve as a judge if he wasn't a human being? Could he really sympathize with us? Could he really represent us fairly and with sympathy and with empathy? Absolutely not. We would be, I would be afraid to appear before the judgment bar of God not having someone to represent me who belongs at, here as a human being. Now, the second reason why Jesus Christ only can judge, and that is that in the judgment there will be no excuses. I want you to imagine someone that says, well, you know, it's easy for you to sit there on your throne and condemn me for all of these sins that I committed that I didn't repent of, but you don't really understand what it was like to go through depression and to go through grief and to have to take drugs. You know what Jesus is going to say? He's going to, excuse me, have you ever been to Calvary? Have you ever been to Gethsemane? Listen, I was tested with drugs. When I was on the cross, they offered me a drug to calm my pain. And I said, no. So what did you say your excuse was? Only a human being who has walked in their shoes can be someone who will accept no excuses in the judgment for hanging on to sin. Let's go quickly to number seven. I didn't think we were going to get through these seven. This is the longest lecture that I have in the series, but uh, we're doing all right. We still have three minutes to go. <laughs> 
Reason number seven why Jesus had to become a man, so that he could come again in his second coming. Let's read quickly John 14, verses 1 to 3, which has been greatly misunderstood. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. You know, many people say Jesus went to heaven to build mansions. No, he didn't. He said, In my Father's house are many mansions. They were there when he said it. Jesus does not need 2,000 years to do heavenly contracting when he created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. So he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now listen carefully. I go to prepare a place for you. We usually think that that means that Jesus went to heaven to build houses and to plant trees and to prepare a place for us. But do you know why Jesus went back to heaven? He went back to heaven to carry on his intercessory ministry in the holy place. That's part of the work of preparation of us for heaven. You see, by living his life on earth, and by dying his death, he now makes provision for me to come to him and say, Jesus, I'm sorry, I confess my sin. I trust in your merits. Please take that life that you live and that death that you die, and Lord, please place it to my account, and I'm accepted in the beloved. That's what Jesus does now. We're going to talk about this in our next two lectures. You know, there's this conception that at the cross, Jesus forgave everyone's sins. No, no. Jesus did not forgive anyone's sins at the cross of Calvary. And you say, wow, this is some kind of heresy Pastor Moore is talking about. I'm going to prove it from Scripture. You see, sin is forgiven when you come to Jesus in faith and you claim what Jesus did by his life and by his death. And then he also has another thing that he has to do to prepare the place for us. He has to perform a work of judgment to shut the devil's mouth. And so now he intercedes in heaven he applies his life and his death, and then he, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and Jesus will be our advocate, and then when his work is finished, he's prepared a place, and he will come again. And as it says in John chapter 14, it says in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And at that time, he will have taken care of the guilt of sin. He will have taken care of the power of sin. And he will have take care and, taken care of the presence of sin. So the humanity of Christ is everything to us. And we can thank Jesus that he became flesh of our flesh.